the role and function of the church. The word church brings forth several concepts, depending on whom you are talking with. Collins Australian Dictionary defines noun, building for public Christian worship, particularly Christian denominations. Christians collectively, clergy, end quote. This definition covers clearly three different thoughts. The first being the idea of the church being a building. This is still a very common and popular thought. I go to church on Sunday. Often the nameplate on the building refers to it as church. Many people, including non-Christians, are very comfortable with this thought. The second being the collective gathering of Christians. This is where we will spend most of this discussion. The third thought is of clergy only. This gives the consideration that essentially only those ordained ministers are the church. From my topical reference Bible, it says, Church, a called out assembly, called out, separated from. The entire group of believers in Christ, usually recognised as existing since the day of Pentecost in New Testament times, and that's in Acts chapter 2, until the future rapture, also called the body of Christ. In a more limited sense, it often refers to the local assembly of believers, end quote. Jesus gave many instructions that sum up the role and function of the church. These received further attention from additional writers throughout the New Testament. These instructions should never be divorced from the teachings throughout the Old Testament on how we as God's people should live and behave. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus gave the instruction to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's from NIV Bible. The process of making disciples starts with sharing the gospel, that's the good news of Jesus, being the Son of God, born in a stable, laid in a manger, walked the land among the people, speaking of his heavenly Father, died on the cross to take our sins, rose again on the third day as prophesied in the Old Testament and in his own words, victorious over Satan, and ascended to his Father in heaven to await the day his Father sends him back to take all his genuine believers to be with him in heaven. The Gospel in a nutshell. Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. We will tell others of all we know. In our proclaiming Christ to others, we will remind them of Jesus' words that we need to turn from our lives without acknowledgement and involvement of Christ and his forgiveness of sin to him and enjoy the, that forgiveness and the relationship that comes from such a decision. The process of discipling people continues with nurturing, mentoring and helping them to understand the scriptures so that they too can grow towards maturity as a Christian. It is very much like growing a child from birth into the rest of their life. The gathering of believers in the local congregation share in this support and nurturing process with prayer and Bible study. Study and be eager to do your utmost and present yourself to God approved, tested by trial, a workman that has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analysing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So says 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 from the Amplified Bible. The church, the local body of believers, have the responsibility to bring people into that relationship with Christ and nurture them without discrimination. A quote from Henry Ward Beecher that I think describes part of the role of the church. The church is not a gallery for the exhibition of eminent Christians, but a school for the education of imperfect ones, a nursery for the care of weak ones, 
and a hospital for the healing of those who need diligent care, end quote. This sums up the role of the local congregation in caring, nurturing and supporting other believers who may well be closer to the beginning of their spiritual journey. As someone who has, hopefully, progressed be along that journey, we have the admonition from Christ to support those newer disciples. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the congregation in Ephesus, gave them the challenge to be imitators of God, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, NIV. This is our target for us to nurture people forward. This also encompasses the behaviour of being holy and pure. Many times through both testaments, we are exhorted to be holy as I am holy, said the Lord. Example, Leviticus 11.45 and 1 Peter 1.16. But with the goal of being holy in the image of God, we need to live pure, agape love. Francis A. Schaeffer says, the Bible teaching is clear. As the bride of Christ, the church is to keep itself pure and faithful. This involves two principles which seem at first to work against each other. Firstly, the principle of the practice of the purity of the visible church in regard to doctrine and life. And secondly, the principle of the practice of an observable love and oneness among all true Christians, regardless of who and where they are. End quote. Again from Francis Schaeffer. In the mark of the Christian, I expressed and developed this thought in a slightly different way. Then I spoke of the need for the simultaneous practice of two biblical principles. The first is the principle of the practice of the purity of the visible church, not the invisible church we join when, we, when by God's grace we cast ourselves upon Christ, Christ, but the visible church. The scriptures teach that we must practice, not just talk about, the purity of the visible church. The second is the principle of an observable love and oneness among all true Christians. The mark of the Christian stresses from John 13, 34 and 35 that according to Jesus himself, the world has the right to decide whether we are true Christians, true disciples of Christ, on the basis of the love we show to all true Christians. End quote. We mentioned earlier that the church is a called out assembly, called out and separated. As a body of Christians, Christ has called us to be light, to be salt, and to have no involvement with the sin practices of the people in our surrounding community. We need to be separate, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17, but still interact with our observable love, to be the light in the darkness, but still rub shoulders with the people, to be salt and influence their lives without being affected by their behaviour, to be pure and holy while we walk and talk among them and with them. God wants us to be the influencers and to achieve that without being turned away from God and join those around us. God gave us his spirit at Pentecost to achieve that. For this purpose, God did not leave us alone and defenceless. He gave us his indwelling spirit to always be in us and with us and to strengthen and to guide us, to equip us and empower us. Along with his spirit, he gives different people within his congregation extra abilities that we call spiritual gifts. These give us, as a combined group, the skills and abilities to be able to carry out all the functions necessary to reach out and witness to the community around us, to draw them to their own personal relationship with Christ. Once we have been instrumental in seeing someone come into that relationship with Christ, we need to encourage them to continually join in worship, prayer and Bible study with other Christians. This will help them remain strong in the juvenile relationship in Christ. Billy Graham was asked a question. My friends claim I am not a Christian because I do not attend church. Can one just be just as religious and good if he is not a member of a church? Part of the answer Billy Graham gave was, the church is a family of believers. 
Christ died not only for the individual but for the church. The Bible says he loved the church and gave himself for it. If Christ loved the church enough to die for it, we should love it enough to associate ourselves with it. End quote. In attempting to identify two other views and theological interpretations, I have had difficulty. I'm aware of some viewpoints that to be evangelical is no longer a part of modern Christianity and to share individual faith in Christ is invading personal relationships with Christ. Some take the view that scripture teaches that God's spirit is in the world and at work. The same spirit will push people through the door of the church. This seems to be based on Acts 2, 17-21, where it says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Some seem to take this as meaning they can sit back because God's spirit will do all the work. But Paul wrote in Romans 10, 14 and 15, that people cannot know or hear the salvation or hear of salvation unless someone go and tell them. There is a historical cultural attitude that has had a huge effect on the church. This has happened periodically since the early church of Acts. When the church has been observably corrupt and lost its holiness and purity, where it has been riddled with conflict, the general population of that area and further have turned away from listening to the message of salvation. Jesus warned in John 17 verse 21 the people would judge him as the Son of God if the believers did not fully show him in their words, in their words, actions and attitudes. The only way forward then for the church is to return to God, confess their sins and seek to be holy as God is holy. Five questions. Firstly, how would you define the church and would your definition be global or local? Secondly, what is your reaction to Schaefer's term observable? Question three, as humans with our physical, mental and emotional limitations, is it possible to be holy as God is holy? Four, thinking of Billy Graham response on the church attendance question, what would be your answer? Five, have you noticed how conflict or corruption with the, within the church or its people affects the attitude of people outside the church? Give examples. Thank you.